Hey guys, today we're going to be replacing the clutch on this 2008 Z06 Corvette. This does not have a stock clutch, it has a monster clutch, and please watch my previous video on why that clutch failed. So, I do have the service manual for this car, and right after this clip, I'm going to try and uh, piece through all of the steps just to begin with, and then I'll kind of go through uh, how I end up doing this. On the service manual they drop the entire transmission support and uh, like all the connecting arms and everything and then they drop the transmission and the drivetrain a lot of people just drop the whole assembly as one which i probably will do i went to harbor freight and i got a transmission jack it's sitting over in the corner of the garage right now before you put your car up on the lift you have a lift make sure you do everything with the shifter which i'll get to later in the video couple key lessons learned You've got to take out that shifter assembly, the whole thing. You, you can't leave this in there. You must take it out. Make sure and do that while it's in before you try and take everything out. Yeah, it's not this clip that you have to pop. It's the one like under here, directly under it. And it's the big black one. When I was extracting this, these two lines right here get caught pretty easily on some of this stuff. Um, also, the hydraulics start to drain more once you have it at an angle laying down, so be careful of that as well. Definitely get one of these. And it, it saved me so much time on several different components underneath the car and on the suspension where there's just like a solid 20 to 30 bolts in different places when you're doing all this. That thing saved me a ton of time. Highly recommend getting it for this job. It really helps to have this strip. You have to do this in order to get the access to that top bell housing bolt. So I'm here editing this video right now and I wanted to mention one other thing is while you're doing all of this, it's really common for the C6 Corvettes to have the fuel level sensors give out. I've had to replace both of mine before, uh, it's a 2008. It's a really, really common thing. Even if yours is a 2013, they will go out at some point. And when you have all of this stuff dropped for the transmission, it makes it way, way easier to go ahead and replace those fuel sending units. So if you have like over 50K and you're doing this on the C6 Corvette, I would just recommend go ahead, replace those fuel level sensors. I promise you, you won't regret it. Yeah, it'll add on a few hours, but doing the fuel level sensors without dropping all the trans is possible, but it takes like 20 to 30 hours. And if you do it without or while having the trans dropped, it'll take you maybe two or three hours because it's so much easier to get to the connections and get everything right. So highly recommend do your fuel level sensors. Also, when you're done doing the fuel level sensors, you know, turn the car on accessory mode and make sure the fuel level gauge is reading and doesn't throw a code to make sure, you know, all that's running good. All right, I just encountered one of the toughest thing, getting this back together that no one really talks about in their videos. And that is, when you're reconnecting this line right here, down under here. Okay, quick tip. This actually really helps so far is I had so many issues getting up here above that wire harness. There's nothing really holding it up. So I got a thin wire without a bunch of time and effort. I can't use the CNS one. So anyway, little things like this. I hope this is really helpful to the viewer because 
I've spent an hour and a half doing this and now you guys don't have to because you know in advance what you could run into. Right now I'm just gonna pull the starter relay, which I believe is this one. Um, 43. Yeah, crank. So if you pull this, it's, it's not gonna start. Also, sometimes the alarm goes off whenever you put the battery back. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pull the horn fuse just so I don't upset my neighbors whenever this goes off and I plug it back in. It's pretty easy to do. The horn fuse is it's right here. I'll set that with the relay. Before you disconnect the battery, I just leave the door propped open with uh, the lip cracked and the rear latch propped open. That way you can just raise it up and then pull this handle if you need to get back in inside. To some degree. Yeah. Just leave it like that. And the door like that. Unfortunately, the GoPro deleted a little bit of my footage during this, jacking up the car and taking out some of the exhaust. So real quick, I wanna cover that. Jacking up the car, I had it in gear with the parking brake on. I pretty much jack it up from here or here and then put the jack stand, or if you have the pucks, you can put it in this insertion on all four corners and also jacked it up right here. Taking out the exhaust, one important, very important thing is there are these hangers right here. You have to take those off. You have to unscrew the bolts on the top of them to be able to have enough wiggle room for the mufflers and for the rest of the exhaust to come out. So on mine, it depends on your exhaust setup, but there's four bolts on here. You can break those loose. What I like to do is once you unscrew one side, a lot of times you can spin it around to the bottom to have better access and then unscrew the second pair. On the mufflers themselves, the rubber holders that support these, it really helps put some soapy water on them. Makes it a lot easier to pop out. I was able to just grab the rubber portions and pull them out. One of them I had to use a pry bar to just pop it off. But again, use soapy water or WD-40 to get those off. The vacuum lines are right here. They're just a little rubber tube going to them on both sides. Pop it off. The first thing I did was take out those support hangers that I just showed earlier. The next thing was taking off all of these bolts right here. And then I took off the brackets right here. After I took off the brackets, I then basically wiggled and pulled from this to here until I pulled this up and out of those portions. I set this to the side and I came back. And once I got the hangers off the, the mufflers, I took out the left side first and just kind of wiggled it over everything. And then I took off the right side. <laughs> Kind of looking over everything and seeing what I want to add while I'm in here. It looks like one of the O2 sensors was OEM and the other isn't. I think the left one is the one that's showing that's going out, but I may go ahead and just replace both of them. At this insulation around the oil return or pump line to the external reservoir, like all of the heat insulation is kind of a little bit crappy on that. I've got some fiberglass wrap and some heat tape that I'll probably tape up that. Some of these O2 wires, just some of the stuff that can be sensitive to heat. Also some of the insulation where things rub, you know, if wires just dangling and it's rubbing, usually you can see that. So just just be looking out for that stuff when you're doing this because now's the time to, uh, to uh, fix and mitigate things like that. Once you take off the headers, two things. One is your starter and second is your crank position sensor. So if I know I had two or three times my crank position sensor throw a code and it went into limp mode. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually inspect that and I might just look at the wiring around it. Maybe if it's not insulated or if it looks a little bit damaged, replace it. Um, and same with the starter. I, I've had some electrical issues where it seems like the starter has trouble. If your starter has like 100,000 miles on it, I just, if you got the money, go ahead and replace it with the GM part because it's just down the road. You get what I'm saying. It's just better to do some of the stuff while you're in here, if you can. These are all 
eight millimeter. If you're doing this with an impact, after a while this can get pretty loud. It's always good to transmission cooler goes up to the front here. I just don't understand for a cooler of the transmission, why is it directly above the exhaust and there's no insulation on that plate above or below it? That must get like really hot. My foot? <laughs> Whenever I come back through here, I'm probably gonna put more insulation around here and probably around here because this whole area gets really hot. Yeah, the insulation just doesn't seem to be good enough. Before you put your car up on the lift, make sure you, if you have a lift, make sure you do everything with the shifter, which I'll get to later in the video. I may not catch all of these, but pretty self-explanatory. Uh, disconnect as many of these wires as you can. That one just has a push tab right there. Um, so I'm just gonna look up through here and disconnect a bunch of these. Yeah. I also recommend kind of twisting. Kind of grabbing at the back, twisting. And make sure, uh, make sure this doesn't break or any parts of it are left on the spark plug. All the way in the back, not back here, right? Recommendation, put a dab of dielectrical grease on the end of your spark plugs where those connect. It'll really help taking them off in the future. Before you drop the header, make sure that the O2 sensor wires at the bottom aren't caught on anything. That can uh, break something if uh, you know it gets caught. Some unplug the O2 sensor, cut some of the zip ties that were holding it in, and now I'm taking it out. Although I do have the headers loose. One question I had when doing this is replacement header gaskets when you have aftermarket headers. So this looks OEM actually. This is a GM one. Yeah, that's a GM one. Yeah, that, that looks to be OEM. Filters getting in the way. Oh man, just barely. It's gonna be very nice getting in here because you can already see there's from previous damage of them taking apart these wires. Which who knows what this? This could be something really important. And if any of that's damaged or nicked or broken, it'll cause intermittent with random electrical issues. Or once it gets hot, have enough resistance to just give out. It looks like these oil cooler or the oil reservoir lines are really in the way and they're gonna have to come off. But what's the point in doing that? You know, I, I mean, I don't really need to take this out. I have most of the room I, I need. So what I'll probably try and do is just leave this in and I can work around it pretty easily. That way I don't have to drain the oil or anything crazy like that. I'm gonna inspect the crank position sensor, I believe is right behind this starter, which I may end up taking out. So looking at this now, these two are the cooler lines. Pretty important, clean these before you do, because if anything shoots in there, you know, you're getting sand or dirt that's going into your transmission oil, which isn't good.
very easy to lose these things, so just be careful. I'm gonna try something. May not work. I've got an earplug. Wow. Wow. Just to be safe. As soon as you're done with this, put these little clips in a bag and label them so you don't lose them. This one just popped right off. This one I had to wiggle around a bunch and once I got the angle right, it popped out. I was trying to like pry on it a bunch and like use bigger tools. You're doing something wrong if that's the case. Just uh, just like very carefully wiggle and push in different directions and it'll pop out. Um, I used two earplugs to cap these. So they're, they're draining pretty heavily oil. So as soon as you pop it loose, put your finger on it and then squinch up with your other hand a earplug Put it in there and it should hold it pretty darn well. Also another thing, if you have the remote bleeder, go ahead and uh, take this out. Looks like a 10 mil right there and I'll just dangle it down so it doesn't catch when taking it off. All right, we're gonna remove this brake line. That way we can let it hang instead of taking the whole thing off and having to bleed this side. So I think that's a 10 mil. I'm gonna break that loose and then Move this caliper and hang it close to here. All right. Got that loose. Now these are... Seems secure enough. On the parking brake, you just hold the spring underneath, pop this up, and then you're able to slide it out. And then this hook just comes off of right there. I'm gonna remove this ground, pop this out, or just do it to where it's loose. I'm disconnecting these because they all end up going back to the harness, which will be coming down. I just don't want anything under tension or to break while I'm doing all this. I got these clips out, I'm running these wires back, but Pretty sure I'm gonna forget where these go. I, the plug may be only one side that it goes into physically, but I, I'm still gonna put this little bag and zip tie this over these two. That way I know which side this goes on. On this one, you just pretty much pull up. All right, taking out those four bolts and these two. These are 15, these are 13. There's a washer that goes in the back right here and the rubber or silicone part goes towards it. Um, I'm sure that serves a purpose. Remember to put, put that back hanger on the, the right hand side like that. See it. I'm imagining this is a little bit heavy, so I'm gonna bring this down slowly. I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna record doing the other side. It's the same as this one. All right, one last thing is whenever you set down the other side, it's connected via the sway bar. So the whole thing's gonna drop. You definitely wanna put a jack underneath and catch that so it doesn't just slam down. I also have these bolts loose. One thing to note, some of these are meant to be like you put the weight of the vehicle back on and then you torque it. So you like, you get everything snug, you set it down on the tires and then you torque it. I'll try and reference that if I see that specified in the service manual. Take pictures whenever you do this. 
can't tell you how many times where you just take a random picture and you really use it when you go back and look at it later. Um, some of the lines up here disconnected. Still working on some of these. Just disconnected this one. This is, I think, the first to fourth solenoid, which uh, looks like there's a there's like a bypass that's aftermarket, so that's just already disconnected. Um, I pulled out this line with ABS. Make note of where you're pulling these out from. There's a clip up there that I'll probably have to snag once it gets lower. I need to disconnect that brake line to the left, to the passenger side, but I'm gonna I'm gonna wait to do that and then the hydraulic until I'm actually about to drop this thing. Review the service manual and some videos because so many times you'll be working on something and you forget something and then you start dropping things and you're like, oh no, I forgot this. So I'm gonna double check before I like jump to any, you know, big moves. All right, there's one. Right there. They just connected, they broke the plastic tab so you can see they just silicone it on. Work though. That's pretty much it. Um, everything else seems pretty self-contained. This, this, the large assembly back here seems like it has a tab right there that I'm gonna have to fool with once I get it lower. That's really, it's really not that much to disconnect, honestly. And none of them are like in really impossible locations. Whenever you get this out of here, I highly recommend if you've never replace your sending units that measure your fuel level those break on the c6 they're notorious for breaking they're extremely common and they're extremely difficult to get to you will save yourself so much time and money and headache if you do it while you have the transmission and the exhaust out it's 10 times harder if you try and do it with all this in I still got to get the shifter out i'm just breaking loose these to make sure i can get to them all then I have to make a trip to auto parts store because I don't have a 21 millimeter long socket, six point or a 13 16 which also works. Um, I just wanna, before I make a trip to the store, realizing that I may have to tra take more, I wanna make sure I can break these loose. I don't think there's one directly on top. I, I think there's that one, which is gonna be difficult to get to because there's the wiring harness in the way, but I think I'll manage. It's important that when the engine is kind of pulling back as you're lowering the back, that this doesn't hit the firewall and damage anything. So periodically, whenever I lower this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna monitor that. We're gonna take this center console area. There's two screws back here. There's two in these caps. T15 Torx bit for these. just kind of a pain to work with. Different cables running along this sidewall. I don't want to get damaged. Just gonna set back here. Kind of pops up and out. This side panel just pops out just gently on this there's a ring that you just pull this down it's actually it kind of slides off to one side and then down and then there's a phillips head screwdriver loose it's not good
else is just pop off like that. Put these on the back. Yeah, it's this tab right there. There's a tab on the thing itself. Push down on this. Gonna leave this. I don't want to lose a screw. Actually, carefully. There you go. Okay, quick lesson learned. Definitely want to take this out while everything's still in because now I can't get to that second bolt in there. So I'm going to have to pretty much reinsert partly it into the trans again. This final one, a little bit sketchy. These are kind of stripped a bit. So hopefully this one doesn't. All right, you do have to take that screw on this, this bottom area right there fully out for this to come out, just a heads up. Hopefully that bottom one isn't broken. Or the top one isn't broken. All right, got the bottom one apart. The top one seemed to get loose and then tight again, almost like it was galled or something. I'm gonna have to address that later. This really, really helped to have two uh, grease cert nipple covers. You can get these like 50 to 100 of them for like five bucks um, also going around the brakes all the ones that are missing and the grease ports on the bottom of some of the suspension components on the front super useful i tried at first to use an air plug to shove that up in there don't do that um, brake fluid is super corrosive and it started to like slowly disintegrate so definitely don't use any sort of foam because the brake is extremely corrosive and it will just eat through it um, I also put a towel underneath. After I'm done with this, I really should be using gloves, but I'm gonna wash my hands thoroughly. Right, so, made this little guy. I won't be directly underneath this. That would be bad in case something happens, but this is what it's, uh, that's what it'll look like. Oh man, this took a minute. I ended up taking off the clip on that silver hose back here, which you can see, which is not the correct one. It's supposed to be let me get a flashlight. It's just supposed to be that one. Well, I popped off the clip and sure enough, it kind of fell down. It took me like 10 minutes to finally find it. Uh, it is magnetic, so if you've got one of these and it's a little tough to reach, this is perfect to grab it. Now, I'm gonna put this in a bag and label it so I don't lose it. It's disconnected. Makes it a lot easier once they're loose. So just barely clear everything. This is the max you want to go down. Um, you don't want to go down any further than this. Cleared it on both sides, just barely. So what I'm seeing is the rear portion has broken loose, but this bottom part hasn't, which leads me to believe it's kind of in a bind right now. And I mean, that makes sense. So worst case, and I already dropped the engine a little bit, not by much. But um, if anything, I'm going to try and uh, screw up the front and kind of tilt it down and push the whole assembly down. That way this kind of evens out a little bit and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Super freaking easy. 
Now I do, I don't want the engine to fall as soon as this comes out. So I want to make sure that I've got the engine actually lifted up. It's not going to fall down as soon as this comes out. Also, I haven't done a very good job of this, but you definitely want to be checking to make sure nothing's in a bind or you're about to bend and break something. Also a quick tip, I had to take out, I had to take off the sway bar on, on the front, just, just the four bolts on either, the two on either side that hold it in to gain access to the front engine mount bolts. These guys, there's two on the back, one right there, one over here, and then two on the front. And I just lowered those to about this level, which I'll need to do anyway to get to the bell housing upper bolts between these three things and those nuts you can kind of adjust everything in and of itself to line it up and then once you have it lined up it should like pretty easily just slide out unless something is in a bind you probably don't want to be like directly under any of this when you're doing this all right Ladies and gentlemen, she's out. I just gotta wiggle and pull her back. Okay, quick lesson learned. Definitely wanna take this out while everything's still in because now I can't get to that second bolt in there. So I'm gonna have to pretty much reinsert partly it into the trans again. So in order to get this, to get the bottom of the shifter assembly out which you have to otherwise it'll hit on the fuel lines and stuff around here I had to put it back on I'm kind of glad I did this I just got some experience on how to like line up the splines it took me about eight tries of like moving the splines wiggling this and then finally it just went in and it like it was about like inch and a half two inches out nothing would happen I could see it it's like just going in but it's not lining up so what I actually did was I used a tool to reach up in there and just gently press on the splines and I was able to move them a couple different times, try again and eventually I got it. I'm finding it's really helpful. I'm not putting much pressure on this, right? I'm just putting like medium to light tension on this. You can see it's not very tight, but I'm using this on the bottom of the jack stand to bring the whole assembly and I'm just doing it on here. Again, it's pretty loose. You know, you're not applying a bunch of force. Uh, but this actually is a huge help. Um, but yeah, now that gives me oh, access to this final one. A little bit sketchy, these are kind of stripped a bit. So hopefully this one doesn't. All right, you do have to take that screw on this, this bottom area right there fully out for this to come out, just a heads up. Whenever you're going this last stretch, be careful of this line right here. It likes to get caught. Kind of have to go at an angle and drop it down from here.
Alright. There's a zip tie holding a piece of wiring. Make sure like none of this is grinding on a brake line or a fuel line when you're taking this out. Um, the wiring harness that goes all the way back is right here and it just slides into this little notch. Make sure before you drop this whole thing down to push, a, push that out and get it out of the way. Couple key lessons learned. You've got to take out that shifter assembly, the whole thing. You, you can't leave this in there. You must take it out. Make sure and do that while it's in before you try and take everything out. Um, what else? Yeah, it's not this clip that you have to pop. It's the one like under here, directly under it. And it's the big black one. Um, so make sure you get that right. Um, when I was when I was extracting this and pulling it further out, these two lines right here get caught pretty easily on some of this stuff. Um, also, the hydraulics start to drain more once you have it at an angle laying down, so be careful of that. As well. Also, the drive shaft seems to have some play in it in relation to this guy, which I don't think it should. I could be wrong though. Also, just looking back, the other job that I did of replacing the fuel sending units, the fuel level sensors basically that have the prongs that break and give out, and this is extremely common on C6s, I can't stress enough, if you have your transmission and everything out, it will make it so much easier to do this now. Please, if you have your transmission out, you have a C6, you know, even if yours is like a 2010 and you don't have the check engine light, I promise you, you will have the fuel level sensors go out at some point. While you're in here, 100% replace those fuel level sensors. It makes the job infinitely easier and easier to get it right and connecting all the hoses and everything. Just wanted to point that out. Definitely get one of these. It'll run you probably around 80 to 100 with the battery and charger at Harbor Freight. I definitely get the four amp hour battery, but man, it, it saved me so much time on several different components underneath the car and on the suspension where there's just like a solid 20 to 30 bolts in different places when you're doing all this. That thing saved me a ton of time. Highly recommend getting it for this job. wondering why I have a pink hydro flask. I got a set off eBay for $30, three sets, instead of just one for $30 new. And it had some special lids that I liked, so. You get the picture. I can't get to the top one. I'm gonna have to probably have to lower. What you can also do is you can loosen these engine mounts. And since uh, some of the weight is more towards the rear, the engine will lean back and you can get to that last one better. Some of these are torqued pretty darn hard. So you can see there's a wiring harness on this top one. That's right there. It's it's taking me a bit of time to get this fished up in there and it not interfering with that wiring harness.
There you have it. Pilot bearing. Feels fine. We'll do a deeper inspection on that. It's like 40 bucks to replace and I'll probably do it, but it's definitely been replaced before when I initially installed this clutch. Here's the bell housing. I hope this better explains if you don't really know what happened, but this piece broke off. It's a portion of this one right here. So this should go all the way around here. I have a small piece that goes in right here. That's the part that broke. It's kind of seized up right here on this plate, but a portion of it broke. I don't know where the rest of, I think it fell out through the bottom through here. This is the hole I cut to just do the first inspection. Fractures in it. I'm glad I'm gonna replace this. Anyway, so pieces of that was flying around. I don't know exactly what all happened, but there's one pivotal moment where I heard this all come out. But yeah, the clutch looks fine. It wasn't slipping at all, which is good. While I'm in here, I'm gonna repair and insulate better some of the electrical components. Got a couple things for that. I got this at O'Reilly, and this is just for wire, I think. This goes up to 350, 400, and then I'll use this high temperature tape. I think this actually goes up to 500 or 600 degrees, which is about as hot as the exhaust is gonna get in certain areas. I've got this uh, fiberglass just uh, weave material. It's pretty thin, but I'll wrap this around different components, and then I'll probably either put this tape or this tape over it. So this, I think, was 10, 15 bucks off Amazon. And this fiberglass was also, I think, 15 to 20 bucks off Amazon. So I've been having, when it gets hot, it takes a second for it to start. Sometimes a starter, you can hear it, it, it's hesitant. So went ahead and took out the starter, disconnected the wires. And one thing I'm just inspecting is to make sure these two are clean. You always want these smaller ones on the outside. So this should bolt on first. I'm gonna go through here and just, with a Dremel, with a small wire brush, just clean this up really good. I noticed that on this main ground for the for the engine that they had it behind this this smaller wire right here. So I'm gonna put I'm gonna clean these both up, make sure this is really clean. Um, you know, this stuff just takes five or ten minutes, and while you're here, especially if you've had the engine out, it's always just good to inspect these things. Stock LS7. This is Luke, not a GM, but for my research, they use the same parts. And as long as you're getting it for the LS7, it's the same. I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty confident on that. But you can see the size difference. Um, obviously this has a twin disc. This has a much larger disc, as you can see just by the surface area, as compared to the Monster. So this is pretty much like a newer generation Camaro or C7 clutch that are in those cars. So they're smaller. You also have to notice that the weight is further out on this compared to this guy. This one came in 52.4 pounds and the LS7 was 57 pounds. So about four and a half pounds heavier on the LS7. I was kind of expecting it might be a little bit more, but still good to note. I do want to measure inside to the back of the flywheel to these forks on both of both of these just to make sure that for some reason there isn't like a shim that I'm supposed to put on this guy because I don't 100% know. You know, it's for the LS7, but I don't know if it's going to perfectly fit on my Corvette. It should for my research, but I'm going to double check that. One thing to note is they both have these inner springs, which I'm not exactly sure what this is. Obviously this one is broken off, so there's three of these, but um, on the LS7 clutch, it's definitely much beefier, and even it goes back to a ring, but it looks just significantly, not significantly, just noticeably thicker as compared to this one, which broke, right? And I, I don't think anything hit this. I think just with heat and excess vibration, and shock that eventually one of these just sheared. Um, probably it happened at very high RPM when it sheared 
for the second time or at least the time that I could hear something and it was, you know, dragging around the bell housing. I don't think that's going to happen. I, I really don't think this clutch will suffer the same failure. Um, from my research on just the surface area of this clutch, it is more than this clutch. However, this, because it's wider, I'm wondering if it will help with torque. And at the end of the day, it's a rift. Like I know that there's a very, there's a good chance that this clutch is gonna burn up. Yeah, if this lasted 10,000, if I get 10,000 out of this clutch driving somewhat gently and just occasionally being hard in it, I'm fine with that. So the reason why I got the LS7 clutch over a monster clutch or having this refurbished or a McLeod clutch or any of the other brands is because I was very disappointed with the lack of information on all of the different aftermarket clutches websites. They don't tell exactly how much everything weighs. They don't give the surface area. They don't discuss why on the OEM one you have these expansion things that you know self-adjust long term and why theirs doesn't and how does that affect the long-term life they don't have dimensions of things they don't really go into the discussion of the dimensions of this to the back of the flywheel there, there's just a lot of details and like the friction coefficient of their plates and i think for a clutch i'm pretty sure it needs to have a torque and horsepower Torque is just a given force at a single moment, and then horsepower is that force over a series of time. They also don't talk about max RPMs, and I think clutches should be rated and designed for that. Not saying that most clutches can't handle inherently higher RPMs, they don't talk about that. And like the McLeod clutches, they don't have these shock absorbing springs on the clutch plate with, if you accidentally dump the clutch or, you know, shock, I think it's really important with such a massive engine to have that sort of dampening. There's some aftermarket companies that had that, but not all of them. Another reason why I got the LS7 clutch is because it has the self-adjusting feature, which I think long-term, if you don't take it to the racetrack or take it to the drag strip and you're just dumping the clutch every single time, then I don't think that's a huge deal. Another reason why I got the LS7 clutch, I know it's going to work. I don't know if it will last as long as some of these aftermarket brands. I'm predicting that it won't and I'm I'm getting prepared for that. What I do know is it's going to have a good feel to it. It should hold up to 600 horsepower just fine at least if I'm not always romping on it. So, new clutch, the bolts for the clutch. New flywheel bolts, two new O2 sensors. This is the insertion guide, some of the grease, and then the pilot bearing. This is the rear main seal and plate and bolts and everything. This I'm probably going to leave on the OEM one and just replace the bearing itself. This is the bell housing. This is the guide for the rear main seal. And then this is the vacuum hose that goes to the brake booster, which I'm going to put on probably right now, but I probably won't record it. All right, the rear cover is off, including the rear main seal. I was worried I might have to drain the oil to do this, and that is not the case. So if you're wondering if you have to drain the oil to replace the rear main seal and or cover, you do not. Right now... Um, just real quick, this is the CNS, so it's just got more material in some of these areas. Um, just a wider area. Um, wider area in some of these. So it's just a little bit um, stronger. All right, one important tip I would recommend is to get some like 15 or 1200 grit sandpaper while it's still oily around here and just smooth out any of these you know surfaces where the rubber's gonna uh gonna go i also went around the crank and smoothed where the gasket or the rear main seal is gonna seal as well um, and then i've wiped it down about three or four times with a clean uh, cloth with brake cleaner just to get all the oil residue out from what i can tell this lip at the bottom does need to have some some sealant on it 
definitely seems like you're supposed to have a bit of a bead because normally you would have a bead whenever you put on the oil pan. But if you're not putting on the oil pan, then you're just relying on whatever is there to seal again, which is is probably won't work. Um, it's neat to see what cam this has, some comp cam. I'll have to look it up later. But anyway, I'm going to probably wipe things down one last time, put a light bead at the bottom of either the pan or this, and then I'll gently push it on and start putting in the bolts. And just clean up the surface while I have everything off and I can clean around it to where if I get any particles back into the seal, it's not gonna mess anything up. Really important to get all the oil out from underneath here. This is probably where some of the oil is gonna be. And then I'm gonna put a, a bigger bead back here in this section, just right here, and then a light bead all the way around how it was before. Because whenever you put on the oil pan gasket, you know, you have a light bead that you're supposed to put on. I also, mainly for the bolts towards the bottom, right, I noticed that a couple of them towards the bottom were wet, meaning that oil had either leaked around here or gotten through somewhere and was getting the, the bolts wet. So what I'll also do is I'll put a dab of RTV just a little bit around the ends of the thread towards this way, uh, towards the, the head of the bolt. And then that way, whenever I fully seat them, um, you know, they'll seal. With that being said, though, whenever you do RTV, it's best to like put it on there, lightly snug it to where it smooths everything out, but not it has some time to dry and then fully torque it, if that makes any sense. And I'll do the same once I put down this bead right here, I'll kind of set everything in place, get everything aligned, get things really lightly snug, let it sit for 15 to 30 minutes for the RTV to kind of start setting. And then I'm going to torque everything down. Great lesson learned here on trying to install this rear main seal. So this is the CNS Corvette one. And what I'm realizing is that, you know, I've, I've spent almost an hour and a half messing with this, measuring things, looking in the service manual just to make sure I'm not missing something. And then I eventually put feeler gauges in the sides and then in the top and the bottom. So this is the original one. I think this is a GM one. The CNS one is sitting over there but I could not, you know, I, I cleaned the gasket material, made sure there wasn't any lumps, which is the oil pan gasket. And every single time I try and install it and then I got these almost, you know, to torque spec without doing anything else. And I could tell that left and right and on the top, it had plenty of clearance to slide in, but on the bottom, it just did not have enough clearance. So I measured with a micrometer basically the gap from the bottom of this to the top of here on both of them. The CNS Corvette, I can't get any numbers smaller on, you know, going side to side to make sure I get the actual lowest point um, besides about 0.31. This one goes to 0.298, which is several thou smaller than the CNS. And I'm discovering that is the difference to get this in the right spot so yeah as much as i want to replace the plate and it, it could have micro fractures in it that's causing very slow oil leaks i don't have the luxury of you know obviously installing that one now what i could do is i could spend a bunch of time getting really fine grit sandpaper and smoothing down as as linearly as i can that lower edge so what i may end up doing is just cleaning up washing this uh the original plate, uh, making sure it's smooth, um, making sure I don't see any large cracks that are gonna weep through, and then just reuse it and replace the gasket. Um, I don't really wanna do that, but it seems like without a bunch of time and effort, I can't use the CNS one. So 
Anyway, little things like this, I hope this is really helpful to the viewer because I've spent an hour and a half doing this and now you guys don't have to because you know in advance what you could run into. All right, got it in and the spacer tool from left to right and up to down feels like about has the same amount of room. Um, these are all 20 foot pounds. I haven't looked up these, I would assume it's gonna be similar. Um, I mean, you can do these by hand. It's just like you go snug and a little bit tighter. It, they're very large bolts. It's not like you're gonna shear this off. If anything, you're more worried about damaging the aluminum cover. Anyway, I'm gonna torque stripe these and then I'm gonna work on getting the seal in. Uh, it says to do it dry. Well, it doesn't say to put anything on it when you install it, so I'm assuming it says to put it in dry. But yeah, I'll turn this tool around and gently tap it in until it's flush. Interesting that the monster clutch had a little bit of play in this and this component in particular shouldn't have any play What you need to do is heat this flywheel up in the oven to like 200 degrees or something for like an hour And then pull it out with gloves and it should slide on pretty easily. What I did was I heated up this guy to about 200 degrees I put on gloves be careful to be to hold it out in front of me put a little bit of grease around here just to make it go on a little bit smoother and if it ever comes off it won't seize up I made sure to clean both sides I haven't cleaned this yet but I did clean the other side make sure everything was smooth um, while it was warm I couldn't I couldn't push it all the way on I probably would have had to get it up to like 250 or 300 degrees and I did I don't want to be holding it with it that, that hot. So I went ahead and installed it with it around 200 degrees. Lightly snugged in these bolts, went in a crisscross pattern until it tugged it down against the crank. And uh, now, I, you, as soon as you, you feel it, once it starts to bottom out at the back, the bolts get like tight all of a sudden. So I'm to that point, I got everything hand snug. And then I'm gonna look at the service manual because there's a very particular torque spec for these. All right, 22 foot pounds in 40 degrees, which I'm gonna accomplish with some practice with this guy. I got a Home Depot for like 30 bucks. It's got a magnet on it. And we're gonna, we're gonna have to see how this works, but. Now, if you're being very cautious, you would weigh these bolts and make sure that they're within a few ounces of each other. I'm not gonna do that, but I should. I just don't have a scale. Um, anyway, uh, doing the obvious stuff right now, brake clean and make sure this is all very clean. There's some dust from the rags. I'm gonna blow that off before I set it in place. Also, wipe down with brake clean the flywheel and sprayed off the uh, the wheel very thoroughly with brake cleaner and then dried it off a good amount. I'm going to put this on and do three increments of tightening to 52 foot pounds. So I'll probably do like 20, 35, then 52 foot pounds and the same one, two, three, four, five, six pattern.
Well guys, I just saved myself potentially blowing up my clutch because I caught this last second before I started to put everything together. A gap between the pressure plate and the flywheel. Short short, these are ARP bolts for the flywheel to the clutch and as you can see that gap right there this is fully bottomed out and the clutch wasn't fully sitting as i just shown and you can see how these last few threads are starting to kind of um, get galled a little bit because i think they're bottoming out it came with these washers but i assumed that just like the oem bolts and i shouldn't have assumed this so this is kind of on me but the OEM bolts don't have washers. And another thing I was worried about, which isn't a huge deal, but it does add up, is they have play in them, in these washers. You must have these washers when you're installing these. So lesson learned there. So I'm gonna put back on the washers, get everything torqued down again, and make sure that pressure plate is actually contacting the back of the flywheel, anyway. One small thing, right, that I assumed of an aftermarket I can't stress this enough. This is why I just, I hate aftermarket stuff because you can run into so many different issues and time consuming things that could cause a blown up engine or transmission or clutch because of something so, so small as this, like ARP. Why do you need these washers, you know? And why don't you specify with the kit? There's just so much. It's like if you had just bought OEM and put that in, you wouldn't have had this issue. You know? All right, just to make absolutely sure, I measured the thickness of this, and then I measured the thickness of that washer, and I have like 0 .08 more room with the bolt washer, so I'm fine. But I just wanted to check before I installed everything again. Okay, so got the clutch back on. I just got them finger tight, and I'm gonna go around in that pattern of pretty much one, two, three, four, five, six, and just snug them down like one full turn and then just go around until I really can't turn it that much more with this guy. And then we'll go 22 foot pounds, 37 foot pounds, up to 52 foot pounds. This is the pilot bearing, and I'm just checking the wear on this. Um, so I slid this on and it's very, very snug. Has a really good fit to it. Making sure that if, if all of this you're installing yourself, it doesn't come in a kit. I've seen videos where people end up having to drop the transmission three times because one of these fittings leaks. This one didn't leak before, so I'm pretty much just reusing the slave cylinder and replacing the bearing. I spoke with the previous owner and this guy has less than 10,000 miles and it looks in great condition. So I'm going to reuse it. Um, other little things, anytime I'm putting these parts back together, I'll be cleaning up the surfaces that meet. And one thing I'm going to test, another thing I've seen people do is these plastic things don't always line up perfect. And if they're not perfect because this has so much of a tighter clearance and these splines that uh, people end up putting everything back together and one of their final steps is trying to insert this in here and they just cannot get it to go in. So one of the things I'm gonna do is without putting the bell housing on, which is time consuming, what I may do is, uh, well, okay, put the bell housing on, just install like one lower bolt. That way it's just super easy to take off if I need to realign the clutch and then make sure that I can fit this spline and assembly into the back of the engine. Because if I can't, then I'll, I'll be spending a whole bunch of time with the bell housing and everything up to that point when I should have just made sure the splines went in first. Okay, quick tip. This actually really helps so far is I had so many issues getting up here above that wire harness. There's nothing really holding it up, so I got a thin wire attached to the wire right there, wrapped it around it and stuck it up above the engine, then pulled that wire up and then held it in place on something nearby to where it's fastened and constantly pulled up. Because I had so many issues last time like trying to pry it up with the pry bar while trying to take out the bolts. 
getting the bell housing in and out with that thing. So I think my best advice is it will save you a lot of time if you go ahead and just do that now, especially while you have room and you're trying to put all this stuff back together and then you can just take it off whenever you're done by just pulling out the wire from the top. It's a good fit. I think first of all, I gotta carefully try and get this inserted and go from there. Guys, it's taking quite a while just to get everything lined up and make sure, you know, the shifter isn't getting caught or I'm not pinching any lines, lifting this back up. The uh, transmission cooler lines just keep leaking and keep leaking, just probably because of the angle. Um, you gotta be really careful about these two clutch lines. Uh, you're not gonna bend them or put them in a bind. I'm gonna, whenever I take this out again, I'm gonna make sure everything is exactly where I want it and snug down because if something's a little bit loose, which I have the top one now loose, whenever I go and start trying to bleed this, I'll be here all day. So it's going okay. I'm going to keep trying to line this up. Really helps to have this strip. Little jack thing. I'm going to use to spin the lines just a little bit gently. Oh, it's not going into the pilot bearing. I can I can feel what it's doing because it got all the way to the engine and stopped. So I'm gonna I might get lucky and I just need to move the transmission jack a little bit. So I just got it into the pilot bearing. I'm, I'm glad I did this. Yeah, I spent just like 20, 30 minutes just getting it set up just to have to pull it out again to install some more insulation up above and make sure the wiring's good and make sure these fittings are tight. Make sure I get the bolts into the bell housing, get those torqued down. But I just, I have confirmation that whenever I get done with all of that, and I go to put it in and I can't get it lined up with the pilot bearing all, you know, all that work is for nothing. So another thing I'll probably do is I'll leave most everything back here unplugged and try and bleed the system as soon as I have most of this stuff up here connected. And then that way I don't have, in, in case I can't get something to work right here, then I don't have to spend all the time, you know, disassembling the rear end again just to drop it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this back out probably won't record all of this but I need to make sure those hydraulic fittings are connected I need to get the bolts in the bell housing I need to put more insulation up there how I want it and um, yeah so that's all gonna take some time I probably won't record most of that all right getting the bell housing bolts back in it made a huge difference to pull that top harness with the wire the whole time that way I'm not messing with it and battling with it the whole time um, most of these you can pretty easily get to. I This bracket wasn't on here when I put it on, but it looks like it's supposed to go here. I don't see anything around here that it goes to, so I'm gonna put that on. Really shouldn't make a difference as long as I still torque this to spec. Um, it made a huge difference to drop the engine spindle just a couple, like down to this level. Like it gave me, like before I wasn't able to thread in this top one at the top, but now I can just reach up my hand with my uh, my finger and my thumb and then just spin it on there and I should be able to get a wrench. And it's like, you have to do this in order to get the access to that top bell housing bolt. And the lower you get, the easier it is to access. Um, it's really not that hard as long as you just know you're gonna have to do it and do it and then it makes things so much easier. So anyway, uh, these are torqued to 37 foot pounds per the service manual. So yeah, that's what I'll torque them to. It's going to be very difficult getting a torque wrench in here and around them though. Alright, 
I'm not gonna record all of this. Y'all know what to do. It's just a matter of getting in here and getting them torqued down as best as you can. Some of these, it might be like really impossible to get a torque wrench in here accurately. So just go to the best you can, 37 foot pounds. So I'm gonna be tucking this insulation around here. Um, I'll be very interested to see how this performs. And I also anticipate that this might be designed to have some airflow through here. So I don't wanna block all of that but I kind of have this and I'll, I'll play with it as I get everything installed and make it tucked up in there and look nice and everything. Um, I'll have to cut out a portion for the shifter, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, worst case scenario, this won't be extremely difficult to remove if I need to. I'm just trying to prevent all the heat soak from going into the cabin because it's really bad on this car. I put a little bit of the grease that was supplied with the Luke kit kind of evenly across these splines as they specified. I've got everything torqued on the bell housing. I inspected the wires up above, made sure everything looked pretty good. Um, I made sure this was tight, um, made sure this was seating good. Everything seems to be okay right here. This guy's gonna need a face like up and around whenever I get this installed. So whenever I start inserting this, I'm gonna have to play with this um, while trying to insert the shaft, so. So a lot to do. Uh, I just got to make sure these lines aren't getting pinched or in a bad, bad spot. This one looks like it's a little bit pinched. So you got to make sure that one is good. Uh, got to make sure nothing is funky with the shifting linkage. If I can't get to that stuff how it is, I got to pull all this out again. There's no point starting to bolt things up until I get that settled. But yeah, didn't didn't go on super hard. I need to pull this wiring harness forward. Perfect. Perfect. All right, I just encountered one of the toughest thing getting this back together that no one really talks about in their videos. And that is when you're reconnecting this line right here, down under here, I have that bore scope. You might think that's super fancy. With this job, it's almost worth getting it just so you know what you're doing and can see in some tight places because I kind of got it set up underneath. And my issue was I thought I had got it connected and I've heard of other people experiencing this. I get into the car, I, I press the clutch pedal and it's rock hard. It won't move at all. Don't force it. Basically there's like a check valve that when you disconnect, or not a check valve, but like a safety valve. And when you disconnect that line, it prevents fluid from draining out, which is nice because you don't spill a bunch of fluid, but getting it physically back together because there's like a spring in there, it's like you can push really hard and it still doesn't pop in and then you have to clip it and you can only get one hand in there at a time. 
it took me several tries, but what I ended up doing was getting this pry bar, which I think you can get off at like Harbor Freight or something. It fits down in there and you can, uh, there's a little loop back there that I lightly pressed against to give it proper support. I, I set my bore scope up there. I began to like just barely with my fingers pop on that clip. And then I push, you know, while pulling this with one hand, my hands on the fitting and the, my finger on the clip, I pushed really hard, got it in, in place. It kind of like popped in. But as soon as you release pressure, it'll pop out. So you have to push really hard, then press the clip on. It was, it was difficult. It was very difficult. It took several tries, but um, I don't have terribly small or big hands, but... Uh, I think it helps to have stronger medium to small hands to do that. Critical thing, if you don't do that, don't freak out and think your clutch is totally, or your master cylinder is bad, you know. Take your time, make sure and get it popped in. As soon as I got it popped in, I got in the car, immediately the pedal's working good. I have the remote bleeder, which right now I just have it dangling underneath the car. I don't have a second person, so what I may end up doing is having some long stick, press in the clutch pedal fully, press that stick and then prop it in place to where it doesn't come back. So it doesn't come back. And then I'm gonna break that valve open until no fluid continues to come out and then close it, bleed the clutch over and over. Another useful thing that you'll be able to walk with me is once I think I've bled the clutch, what I'll do is I'll stick this within the bell housing and see the travel of the slave cylinder just to verify that it looks appropriate. I haven't even bled anything, which I know I will need to bleed, but That is freaking brilliant. Alrighty guys, pulled the wiring harness up and over. Still have everything kind of hanging down. Uh, just connecting everything. I took a bunch of pictures, which I would highly recommend doing where this stuff goes. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you saw where those two go. Let's get the strong under here. And there's that tab right there. This stuff, I, I can't remember where everything went, so I'll just go and look at my pictures. I won't record all this, but it's pretty self explanatory. Uh, once I know I have everything connected right and I'm happy with how things look, I will probably go ahead and uh, hang over my exhaust just for the time being to get it in there. I think that's gonna save me some time in the long run. And then I'll slowly start to lift everything up with the engine and reconnect everything. So I'm going ahead and putting in the exhaust, which may end up being a mistake, but I'll let you know if it works out to be easier, because it's kind of a pain to wiggle, wiggle these things in once everything's up in the air and you start tightening everything. So, um, and then I can also kind of look at how I want to rig up some of this wiring before I permanently put in the exhaust. While I was doing this, I did notice that the exhaust pipe did get bound up on this right side as I was lifting up. 
so I couldn't lift up anymore. So I had to free that before going any further. Um, yeah, I'm just screwing things on slowly but surely. Get the uh, suspension and everything set up correctly. Jack the side up to take off the strain on the CV axles. I don't really want to leave those hanging and just, yeah, keep working at it. Feels like the CV axle on one of the ends, probably the one upstream is popped out, so I can't actually get it inserted, which isn't good. Pop the CV axle in, but just a reminder, the washer goes like this. All right. I got things just snug on this side. I want to counsel the service manual before I get any farther because I think you're supposed to have it under its own weight torquing some of these, which obviously you can't do with the wheel on, but sometimes you can put some pressure on here and you know push a load and make sure everything's snug in here before you actually torque it to spec. Um, still little things to do. There you have it. Jack is out. morning I'm hoping to be driving this thing today but a bunch of torquing to do I just spent about 10 minutes looking in the service manual and um, just getting these are gonna be 22 foot-pounds upper control arm is 48 pound-feet so all four of those will be 48 pound-feet are 81 pound-feet including the cross members for the engine. What I'll probably do, torque the engine ones first, and then the sway bar. Sway bar nuts are 70 foot pounds. Bolts are 74 on the rear and the front, I believe. And that's pretty much it. So I'll just be going around the car, torquing the, everything up. It's all broken. It's just so many little things of, you know, getting one bolt for the brake harness tightened, making sure these are all zip tied. I, I think I routed the wiring harness in one specific area differently from when I pulled it out. And subsequently it's was, it was closer to the exhaust. So I had to like zip tie that out of the way and I just happened to notice it. And if I hadn't have noticed it, it could have burnt up on the exhaust and caused all kinds of issues but I'm getting close to putting the headers on I'm actually gonna clean this a little bit before I do <clears throat>
it's the little stuff that gets you, man. Like, I don't remember any of these bolts being screwed up, and maybe I screwed something up when I was getting it in, but this one was just totally starting to gall whenever I put any bolt in, so. And it's taking me 30 minutes just to get this one header on. It's crazy. But it's coming together. Oh, I forgot to gasket. I'm just... While I'm doing these headers, it would really suck if you left one of these wires hanging down touching the header. So before you bolt everything and get it perfect, be looking out for that. All right. Um, I haven't recorded most of the stuff, but just bolting up the exhaust, making sure there's no wires caught in the way. Everything's where I want it. I got that belly pan above the exhaust back on. I haven't torqued the exhaust to the muffler clamps yet. I, I'm going to run it just a little bit before I do some of the last stuff and the sway bar and just go through everything and put back the interior. Um, just anticipating if something goes wrong, although I don't want to think about that. It's a real possibility. Um, so right now I'm just going to get kind of the interior. I, I might... I might get it to the point where I have everything plugged in, that way I don't have any funky lights come on, and then I'll fire her up. transmission fluid getting on the headers but everything looks okay no major leaks yet Fuck! <laughs> 